Thank you, brother. My name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at the Way. And uh, boy, I think that's my new favorite song. That uh, another in the fire. Like that's like. Uh, I wish you guys could like follow me around and like sing that as I'm walking around during the day or something. That would be weird. If you were, like, all day. But anyway. So again, my name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at the Way. We're not going to waste any time. We're going to jump right into the Word. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4, uh, and we're going to focus on a single verse today, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, to tee up as we move into the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount for a number of months, and as I was trying to outline it, look at it a little bit, I think we could actually spend longer than that. I mean, there's so much in the Sermon on the Mount, and I can't wait to dig into uh, into the words of Jesus. So we're pivoting from our, our study, first love on Jesus, from who Jesus is to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. And remember last week we talked that our lives have to validate the message. It's not the other way around. It's not that we live holy and righteous and good lives and that people see us living holy and righteous and good lives and say, oh, I see that you live a holy and righteous and good life. Please tell us about Jesus. No, that's not how this works. We have to be proclaiming the message with words, with our mouths at all times. And then our lives serve to validate the message that we do proclaim. And we're going to talk about what that validation is will look like today and in the weeks ahead. So Matthew chapter 4, this uh, records the transition into the Sermon on the Mount, and this is the most famous sermon, well known, and interestingly, if you read the whole thing through from start to finish, uh, it would only take you about 15 minutes to read the Sermon on the Mount, and you might say, well, gee, if Jesus could preach a sermon in 15 minutes, then why do we take almost twice that? And it's like, well, I'm not Jesus. So we're going to take a little bit longer than that, but it takes about 15 minutes to read through the Sermon on the Mount. And it, and it happens fairly early in Jesus' ministry. So he's baptized by John the Baptist, and then the initiation or the inauguration of his ministry is when the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness where he's confronted by Satan. Uh, he fasts for 40 days, and then he's tempted by Satan uh, three separate times. And if you think that the things that we are tempted with, uh, what was Jesus tempted with? But everything. I mean, Satan offered him everything in his temptation. Then he returns from the wilderness, and the first place he goes is to the, to the synagogue, to church. And he stands up, and somebody hands him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he begins to read, quoting Isaiah. And this inaugurates his ministry here on earth. And then the, the word tells us that he, he starts to travel around and heal people. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, our verse today, it says that he began to proclaim, <coughs> Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, and that is our verse for today. That is the message. And we're going to dig into this verse just a little bit. As he, as he gets into the Sermon on the Mount, what we will see, this is the message right here. We're going to leave this up here for the duration of the service. So that we can continually remind ourselves that we've got to be proclaiming with words this message to repent. Calling people to repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the same message that John the Baptist was proclaiming leading up to Jesus. And he proclaims the exact same message. It's not that the kingdom of heaven is in the future. It's here now. It is here now. It has been inaugurated by Jesus. It will be consummated one day when he returns. But the kingdom of heaven is truly at hand. And what we'll see is that the Sermon on the Mount is like a window into the kingdom of heaven. Well, how do people act in the kingdom of heaven? What are, what are the people like in, the, in this kingdom? I've heard about this kingdom of heaven. Can, can you tell me a little bit about it? And, and the, the Sermon on the Mount is a window. It will show us what things are like in the kingdom of heaven. Every day, you, me, all of us, we make thousands of decisions every single day about how we're going to act, right? Thousands of decisions. Think of the decisions you made. At some point, you decided to be here this morning. Great decision. Good decision. You decided what you're going to wear. You decide what you're going to wear every single day. You decide what you're going to eat. You decide where you're going to go, what you're going to do when you get there. 
You decide what you're going to say, whether you're going to open your mouth and speak, how you're going to speak, in what manner you're going to speak. A lot of your decisions involve relationships. You decide how you are going to interact with the people that you will see, whether you are going to interact with certain people. You make decisions regarding that. Am I going to act patiently when my children come and disrupt the thing that I think I should be doing? Am I going to act gently when my spouse does something that I don't think he or she did, should do? We make decisions every single day about how we are going to act. And what this word tells us is that a question that we ought to ask ourselves before we do anything or as we are doing anything is, does this validate the message? Does how I am planning and preparing to conduct myself validate this message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's a couple presuppositions here. There, the, the first is that there is a message. Well, I'm showing you the message. The second presupposition is that you proclaim it. That you open your mouth and tell this message to other people. And it is our lives that validate this message. And we're going to talk about this distinction because what we will see is that it is, it is distinction that validates the message. The distinction of the Christian life. <coughs> and as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, I pray that we would keep this focus. We're going to go through the entire sermon with this focus on the distinction, the distinctives of the Christian life. Because again, this is a window into this kingdom of heaven. Let's talk about distinction for a little bit. We're going to jump into two texts, and you can flip with me if you would like, or you can just listen. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2 for a while, and then we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 18 before we end up back at Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. And so let's talk about distinction for just a minute. The letter to 1 Peter is a great letter to talk about distinction. Peter is writing to Christians who are scattered around the kingdom of, uh, of Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. And he's writing to these Christians who are living in and amongst people who are hostile to the gospel. He's writing this message to Christians <clears throat> living in and among people who are hostile to the gospel. In the first Peter chapter two, he writes to them. Starting in verse 9, now he talks about those who do not believe. Those who do not believe stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. That'll preach right there. We're not going to camp out there. But then in verse 9, Peter says to these believers, But, what is my favorite word in the Bible? But, but here it is. But you, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, a people for his own possession. This is who you are. Who you are, how you perceive yourself, likely drives how you act. And here the word of God through Peter informs us about ourselves. It tells us we are a chosen race, that God has chosen his people. He has chosen a people for himself. We are a holy nation. We are a nation of believers. And we are holy to be set apart. To be distinguished from those around us. This is who he has called us to be. We are a people for his own possession. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus. You are possessed by the Lord God on high. This is who you are. This is what he has made you to be. And again, let who we are inform how we act. He says this is who we are. He declares it. He proclaims it. We receive it. We believe it because it says it right here. John, Jesus, in the book of John, chapter 17, he declares to us that you are not of this world. I sent you into the world. He has sent us into this world, but we are not of this world. Look at, listen to Paul in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 20. He listens to what he says. But our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. 
And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, you are a citizen of this kingdom of heaven. You are, your citizenship, listen to me, your citizenship as an American is secondary. It is far, I love this nation, I love this country, and I'm on a, I'm on a tangent here. I'm on a tangent, but listen to me, America, as much as I love it, will one day be a footnote in the salvation history of his people. That is a fact. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven if you are a believer on the Lord Jesus. And we ought to be distinguished. We have to be distinct from those around us. And it goes all the way back. God has always called his people to be separate, to be distinct. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 18. I think you'll see some, some great truth here in the book of Leviticus. So God calls his people out of Egypt. He calls them out of slavery. He delivers them miraculously. He raises up Moses to lead them into freedom from their bondage. And then he takes them to Mount Sinai and he calls Moses to the mountain and he gives Moses the law there at Sinai. And here in Leviticus chapter 18 verse 2 he says to Moses or he says to the people through Moses. He says, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. It's interesting. This phrase is, is bracketed by the phrase, I am the Lord your God. That reminds us that we are his. He is our God. And he says, I pulled you out of Egypt, out of slavery. You don't act like they used to act back there. That's not how you conduct yourself. And I'm calling you to the land of Canaan. And you will not conduct yourselves the way the Canaanites conduct themselves in that land. And here's why. Because if, he goes on to elaborate in several places, if you intermarry with them. And he calls them to drive them completely out of the land. He says, if you intermarry with them, if you intermingle with them, if you give your sons to them as husbands and take their, their daughters as wives for your sons, eventually you will abandon the worship of me and unfortunately that's a little bit prophetic because that is exactly what happens to the people of God they fail they fail in their mission to drive the people out of Canaan the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Hittites and all these different ites they fail in doing that and it happens exactly as God says they begin to marry these foreign women and then they begin to worship the foreign gods. It's called syncretism. It's a horrible word. That is the blending of the worship of the one true God with the worship of false gods. And there's no false gods. There's no such thing as a false god as we've learned on our Wednesday night study. These are demonic things that they are worshiping. And so you're blending the worship of God with the worship of the demonic. And God hates syncretism. And that's exactly what happened to his people. They failed to be distinct. God called them to be distinct. They failed in their mission to be distinct. We got to be distinct from how we used to be. God called them from bondage. He says, do not conduct yourselves as the people in your former bondage conducted themselves. And that is a reminder to us that we ought not to act like we used to act. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, there is a distinct dichotomy. There is a before and there is an after. There is a, I was this and now I am this. And it reminds us of this in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Once you were not God's people, but now you are God's people. There is a distinct before and after. And consider this. Consider if you are a believer what that actually means. That means that God has reached into the chest and removed your heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh that you may believe. God has given you a new heart. He's given you a new nature. He's called you to a newness of life. You are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. New things have come. He's given you a new family. A new mission. He is now your father. He has adopted you into the family of God. He's given you new life. He's given you freedom. He's called you out of slavery, out of bondage to sin and self. The Holy Spirit himself 
indwells you to empower you, to equip you to live a holy and righteous life. How then could we still conduct ourselves exactly the same as we did previously, knowing all of that has occurred? How could we possibly conduct ourselves how we did previously? We've got to be careful. So I think of uh, my mother, Granny Smith. <coughs> Granny Smith was uh, raised in a Christian home. And this is, this is how I wish my testimony. She was raised in a Christian home. Became a Christian at a, at a young age. Doesn't remember exactly when she became a Christian. And then her, lived her entire life walking out her faith in different ways. And so she does not remember a distinct before and after for her. She doesn't recollect her life before she knew the Lord. And that's a great testimony. I was an adult convert in my 30s. Before I came to know the Lord. And so there is a very distinct in my mind before and after. It's very obvious to me when I think back to who I was before I knew. I mean, I think back to that man and he's a stranger. I don't even know who that man was. I don't, I don't even know who that is when I look back and think about myself. But there's got to be a before and after. But we got to be careful. And we never want to put ourselves in a position of judging somebody's salvation based upon the fruit of their works. Now, if somebody says they are of the faith, we believe them. We listen to them. And we encourage them. We come alongside them. We bring them into the fold. And we say, hey, walk with us. You are our brother or our sister in Christ. We love you. Come and be with us. Now, if they're not showing fruit, then we encourage them. Brother, we, we think we can show fruit in this way, but we never judge somebody based upon their salvation or our perception of their salvation. We must be very careful when we look at how people conduct themselves. We have no idea what's going on in a man's heart. No idea where he's at in his sanctification. No idea where he has come from. <coughs> but my fear, my fear that is palpable... Is that we are filling our pews in the American church with people who do not know the Lord as evidenced by their conduct. My fear is that we take thousands of youth and we bring them together and we flood them with emotional music and we, we put a decision before them and we give them a prayer to pray and we say, now you are good to go. And, and these youth grow up and it's no surprise that the youth are abandoning the church in droves. As soon as they turn 18 and leave the home, they abandon the church. That is an indicator. That is an indicator that there was never any faith there in the first place. Can we put the cookies on the bottom shelf? If there is no, if there's absolutely zero evidence, zero evidence of any kind that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, then what on earth would make you believe that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus? There ought to be something. At the very least, there's a problem of some kind. We got to ask these hard questions because if we don't ask these hard questions, we may possibly be leaving people to sit and die in our church pews. To die condemned in our church pews. And what a tragedy that would be. We cannot look back to how we are. We cannot look back to the things we used to do. Now we wrestle with the old man inside of us as we grow in our faith. The, the old man just doesn't die right away. But we got to crucify the flesh every day. But we're going to fight that fight every single day of our flesh that wants to go back to the way that we used to be. But we got to fight that fight. We got to fight that fight. I got to spend some time with a couple of, I uh, almost said a couple of young people. A couple of young people. <laughs> I consider myself a young person still. <laughs> Is that accurate? <coughs> I got to spend some time with a couple of young folks uh, a couple months ago. They called us up and said, hey, we'd like you to come to our home and pray with us about some different things. And so Amy and I and another lady went to their home to pray with them. And one of these ladies was a, she was trans, gender trans, she was trans something. She was a lady. But she, she dressed as a, as a man, she, she cultivated, she even used a, a, uh, a male name. And she asked me at one point, she said, if I become a Christian, do I have to change? 
And what she really meant was by that was, if I become a Christian, would Christians make me change or try to make me change? Is what she meant by that. I assured her that if she came to know the God of the universe, that she would have no choice but to change. Now, how that happened was between her and God, but how can we come before the risen Lord Jesus, the God of the universe, the creator of all things? How can we come into relationship with him and there not be change? There has to be change. And so the Christian life is a life of distinction. And as it validates the message, here's the message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And my distinction from my previous way of life is a validation of this message. It's a powerful validation of this message. We cannot act like we used to act like we did when we were in bondage back in Egypt. He says in Leviticus, you cannot act like they act in the land that you're going to, the Canaanites. You can't worship their gods. You can't act the way, conduct yourselves the way that we conduct ourselves. This is a reminder we cannot act like the world around us. We cannot act like the world around us. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Keep your conduct honorable amongst the Gentiles. Why? So that they, when they speak against you as evildoers, they will speak against you. They will malign you. They will slander you because they hate you because they hate Jesus. That's going to happen. Keep your conduct honorable so that when they do that, their charges will fall empty. And the only accusations they can make is against the Lord himself. Keep your conduct honorable so that their charges ring hollow that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation, either in judgment or salvation. But either way, we know that all things glorify God. Keep your conduct honorable amongst the Gentiles. Peter tells us here in 1 Peter chapter 2, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be conformed by the, the transformation of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world. Listen to 1 John. I like 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Boy, that'll preach right there. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you, John tells us. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with all of its desires. This world is passing away along with all of its desires. We've got to be distinct from, separate from the world. Now, we can do that here in America today. And it will cost you very little. Right? What does it cost to be distinct from the world in our nation today? Maybe some discomfort, ridicule, scorn on occasion, perhaps. Vast portion of the surface of the earth, it's not that way. It is costly to be distinct from the world, even up to and including your life. Not that way here yet. And can I make a distinction here? Can I make a distinction here? Here people say, well, Jesus hung around the sinners, right? Jesus hung around the sinners. A Amy and I used to teach uh, college-age Sunday school down at, at Hilldale Baptist many years ago. And we had a student that we loved to death. <laughs> I mean, I love this guy. He was a good old boy, good old guy. And he liked, he liked his whiskey. He, he loved his whiskey. And he liked to drink his whiskey in the bar. I mean, he liked to go to the bar and drink his whiskey. And he used to say things like, well, that's where I do my mission work, is at the bar drinking my whiskey. And I used to say, John, let's not lie to one another here. You like your whiskey. You like the bar. Well, Jesus hung around with sinners. Jesus did not hang around with anyone. Jesus never just hung around. Yes, he went to sinners. He went to tax collectors. But he went to them with the message to call them from their sin. He went to them with this message, with the words of life saying, come, be a part of this kingdom. Don't stay where you're at. He didn't just go and, and tarry about in the bar and drink and hang out with people in their places where they were. He called them 
to him. He didn't just go and hang out with people if we can again put the cookies on the bottom shelf. They used thought streams like that to justify lifestyles that they enjoy. If we can just be honest with ourselves. We got to be distinct from the world around us. But it's hard because the world will demand that we conform to the world. The world will not be content to allow you to do you and to allow them to do them. No, they will demand nothing less from you than absolute obedience and conformity to what they proclaim to be true. But we've got to resist that and be distinct in our walk. <clears throat> because here's the bottom line. Here's the problem with all this. A failure to be distinct is intentionally damaging to the mission, to the message. Think about it. If our lives, if our distinction is what validates the message, then any refusal we have to be distinct, it undermines the validation of the message. We see a failure to be distinct everywhere today. We see it in the hearts and minds of individuals. I feel the temptation inside of me to conform to the world around me, to act like those around me. I want to be just like everybody else. I want to participate in some of the things that they do. We see this failure to be distinct in the church today. The church is the Walmart effect. Bigger has to be better. Bigger's got to be good. If we're not bigger, we're not doing something right. And so we forsake traditional practices and we adopt things that attract people to us. We have bigger and flashier programs. Our, our worship starts to look like a, a rock concert with lights and all this, that, and the other so that we can attract people to us because we got to look like the world so they will come and be a part of us. And the greatest tragedy here is when this failure to be distinct invades the gospel message. Because what is the ultimate desire in a man's heart apart from Christ is to make everything about us. And so we'll even take the gospel message and pervert the gospel message and make it all about me. What can Jesus do for me? How can Jesus bless me? What can Jesus give to me? How can Jesus heal and fix me? It ain't all about you. The gospel message is not all about you or about me. This is the danger. This is the damaging, the damage done by a failure to live a distinct life. We got to be distinct from how we used to be. We got to be distinct from the world around us. This is the call that God gives to us so that we can validate this message that you see behind me. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let me show you the kingdom of heaven. Think about it like this. <clears throat> if I was from another country and I wanted to get you to come and immigrate to my country, I have to do a number of different things, right? I can't just be nice to you and show you some pictures of my country and say, well, that's a nice place. It looks nice to live there and go about my way. If I just tell you about my country and you say, well, that's nice. The pictures are worth a thousand words. I'd like to see it too. But what if I could show you a postcard from my country and say, here's the address or the phone number to the immigration office. Here's exactly how you become a resident in my country. And I say, boy, that person sure was different, kind, different, distinct. I've never met anyone like that before. We've got to realize that it's distinction not for its own purposes, but distinction with a purpose to validate the message. We can't make it all about us because we got to be proclaiming the message. It goes all the way back to even before Leviticus, Abraham, when he was given the call to come, uh, to go, to leave where he was at, to go to a land where God would show him, God told him that he would bless all of the nations, all the families of the world through him. This is the message that must go out. Listen to what First Peter, Peter says in First Peter when he tells us that you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. There's no period there. There's a comma there. There's a comma. And he goes on to say <clears throat> that you may proclaim. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We got to do both. We got to live distinct and we got to open our mouths. We got to do those two things that they would validate one another, that we would validate this message. And so as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, that we would keep that in mind. 
that we would reflect upon how these actions, how this thing, how this way that Jesus is calling us to live is distinct, but how it validates this message as we proclaim consistently, as we proclaim frequently, as we proclaim with every single chance and opportunity that we have. And so, as we get ready to wrap this up, my prayer <clears throat> that this would be an opportunity for us to examine ourselves. How are we distinct? How are we conforming to the standards of the world as opposed to the standards of Christ? How are we conforming to the way we used to live before we knew the Lord? Is there a distinction? Are we living differently? And I pray that the Sermon on the Mount will give us a window into the kingdom of heaven and will inform our conduct as to how we ought to act to validate the message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So as I'm praying, I pray that you would consider how you used to be, how you are now. Are you distinct? Is there distinction? And lastly, perhaps you're not a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps you're still a resident of the United States of America or somewhere else. Maybe you've never been adopted. Maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you've never been set free from bondage to sin and self. And so I proclaim to you today the message of Jesus. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now. You don't have to wait. You can join this morning. Repent. I believe in the Lord Jesus. Save me, God. I am a sinner. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Please, Lord, we just love you. And we praise you. God, I thank you for the message that you have given to us. This message to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God, to start with, if there is anyone who is here today who is not a member of the kingdom of heaven, God, that today would be the day of salvation. God, that today they would realize their sin and their separation from you, their need for an all-sufficient Savior, that today would be a day of salvation. God, that even now your Holy Spirit is pressing upon their hearts, calling them to repent. And so, God, we are obedient to your words as we plead with them, be reconciled with God. Be reconciled this morning. Receive the forgiveness of Jesus. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from to the dead. That today would be a day of salvation. Don't wait any longer. God, I pray that you would press and press that upon the people's heart today. That there would be an understanding that tomorrow is not promised. God, that the only thing we own is the very breath in our lungs right now. And so, God, if there's a single person here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, God, I pray that they would not be able to leave this place without falling on their knees and calling upon the name of the Lord. God, for those who are members of your kingdom, the kingdom of heaven today. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts. Teach us, illuminate truth to us. Reveal to us. God, reveal to us things hidden in our hearts. Maybe we cherish sin. God, I've cherished sin. Forgive me for the time that I've cherished sin. God, forgive me for when I love my sin more than you. <clears throat> God, may we see our sin for what it is. God, may we see our sin as you see it. God, may we feel about our sin as you feel about it. And when I look at how I was, God... And what you have made me into, all of us, we glorify you. Only you can do that, God. Only you could take a wretched sinner 
Redeem them. Purify them. Sanctify them. Give them new life. And so we praise you, God, for the work you've done in our hearts. As you have called us to newness of life, as you have made all things new, as you are continually making all things new. And so forgive us when we cling to the old ways. Forgive us for when we cling to the things that used to be in our lives. God, wash our hands anew. Cleanse us anew every single day. God, forgive us for conforming to the world around us. God, forgive us for having worldly speech. God, forgive us for talking like those around us, acting like those around us, conducting ourselves, whether it's at work, home, wherever that may be. Again, God, that you would call us to distinction, that we would live lives of purity and holiness that validate this message. And lastly, God, I pray that our, our desire to live pure and holy, not lives, would be rooted in a desire to proclaim and to honor you. Not in any kind of legalistic way, God. We know we can't earn your favor. We know we don't merit your favor. But God, call us to distinction. Show us where we ought to change. And change us. Empower us to change. Don't let us be content to live mediocre lives, God. Mediocre spiritual lives. Let us pursue excellence in following you. But most of all, let us pursue you, God. God, I pray that you would speak to us today in the powerful and precious name of Jesus, I pray. So would you stand with us as we sing and, uh, and just reflect on these things as Joe and folks close us out with the song. I don't want to neglect the uh, instruction that we're given. 